Hello, good morning and welcome. I am Manuela Damen from Stazione Zoologica Anton Dorna in Fano, speaking from Italy. And uh, thank you very much for joining us to the 2022 webinar series, Mediterranean MPAs Facing Climate Change. Today, we will have the second web webinar on monitoring protocols to track climate change in Mediterranean MPAs. Uh, we welcome uh, more than 130 participants to this webinar, joining from uh, more than 50 countries. This webinar is organized by the MPA Engage project, engaging Mediterranean key actors in ecosystem approach to manage marine protected areas to face climate change, in association with two other projects, the MPA Networks and Amare Plus, all projects funded by the Interagmed funded project. The main goal of the project is to promote the resilience of Mediterranean marine ecosystem face to climate change by developing a full toolbox for MPA manager. This toolbox is intended to be used across the Mediterranean MPAs and beyond. Uh, before we start, I need you to give you some uh, technical information concerning the webinar um, as shown in the second slide uh, that, uh, okay. Um, the webinar will be recorded and then posted in the YouTube channel of the MPA Engage project. The presentation uh, will last some more than 50 minutes today, probably 60 or 70. And during the presentation, you can post questions using the question box uh, at any time. At the end of the webinar, we will dedicate around 30 minutes to answering this question. And we will do our best to answer also by email uh, to those questions that we will not be able to take during the session. Uh, fin finally, you are more than welcome to share your impressions about the webinar using the hashtag MPA webinar on Twitter. Uh, finally, we can, we can come to the contents of this uh, webinar module. Today, our speakers will explain how to track climate change effects on seawater temperature condition, onset of mass mortality events, and changes on fish assemblage, including native and alien species. The training will illustrate how to perform field operation, data upload, and information sharing. The panelists today are uh, Nathalie Bensuisson, uh, Ernesto Zurro, and uh, Joachim Garabou. Um, I will let the speakers introduce themselves. So first, uh, hello, Nathalie. Uh, I leave you the floor for introduce yourself. Good morning, uh, good morning, Manuela. Good morning to all. Uh, so I'm Nathaniel Bensoussan, coastal oceanographer, data scientist, uh, actually postdoc at the Mediterranean Institute of Oceanography. And I am one of the scientific coordinators of the team Ednet uh, since uh, its beginning. So today I'm going to introduce uh, how to monitor temperature conditions in the coastal zone. Uh, for high at high resolution and over the long term. Okay, thank you, Nat. Now uh, I leave the floor to Ernesto also to introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm uh, Ernesto Azzurro speaking from the CNR Irbeam of uh, Ancona, Italy, and uh, I'm senior researcher at the um, CNR. And uh, well, I, I will present. Uh, the visual census protocol, which is a simplified uh, visual census uh, methodology to track some of the effects or biotic responses of uh, climate change in the in the coastal areas of the Mediterranean Sea. Thanks. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, finally, we have uh, Kim's introduction, and uh, he will also give a short presentation for setting the scene of the uh, topic of today. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Manuela, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, this webinar. I'm uh, Joaquin Garrabo. I'm a senior scientist working at the Institute de Ciencias del Mar in Barcelona, and I am a marine ecologist working on marine conservation. And um, I am with uh, Nathaniel, uh, the coordinator of this uh, Temen Net uh, network, which I'm going to explain just uh, after this uh, short presentation. 
And uh, today I'll, I will introduce you as well the, the protocol to track um, uh, the mass mortality of, uh, events in, in the Mediterranean, some uh, protocol to, to quantify this, this kind of events. So maybe we should start uh, with the presentations. Uh, just a second. So I think that you know, you see my screen. So I, I, um, I, in these uh, first minutes, I want to set again the, the scene uh, on uh, what is happening in the Mediterranean with the climate change. So uh, probably you must know that we are in this uh, climate crisis, but it's uh, certain that uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, we are al already in the situation that uh, the, the international efforts, the international agreements uh, try to avoid which is to reach this uh, 1.5 degree uh, planet. So in the Mediterranean, in this uh, figure that... Uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean, uh, if you see the, the two lines uh, here, the, the green and the blue uh, one, the blue one is the Mediterranean, and you see that it's uh, up higher than the, the green one, which is the, the global uh, mean on the air uh, conditions. So. The Mediterranean is already experiencing what uh, what uh, it's going to be our world uh, uh, in uh, in in the climate. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Kim. Sorry, Kim. I, yes. We cannot see your presentation. I'm sorry to interrupt ah. you. Oh, thank you, Manuela. Um, just a second. Sorry about this. Uh, now you should be able, right? No. No? no. Okay, now yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry about this. Um, so uh, I, I just repeat uh, what I say that the Mediterranean, we, we are welcoming the, the world that we try to avoid with these uh, Paris agreements and these international uh, efforts that we are doing to, to halt the, the climate uh, crisis. So if in this figure, what you see is the, uh, the evolution of the uh, air temperature in the, in the planet. Uh, the green line is the global uh, value. And you see that the Mediterranean, which is the blue line, is uh, already reached this uh, 1.5 uh, degree. So uh, the Mediterranean has the responsibility to to uh, to see. We have even more responsibility to to uh, try to avoid uh, the effects of uh, the climate change. And with the solutions uh, that we implement, maybe we can uh, provide some uh, lessons learned to the rest of uh, the, the the world and uh, transfer this in information. So it's not only happening uh, that the, the, the temperature is rising um, in, uh, in the air. Uh, we already know that uh, the sea temperature is uh, as well rising really fast. And um, in fact, this, uh, in this uh, figure, in this map, you, you see uh, the warming rates uh, across the Mediterranean, uh, across the different ecoregions in the Mediterranean. And you see that there is um, uh, differences uh, across the, the basin, so much higher in the east and uh, less in the west. But what is clear is that overall the Mediterranean uh, is, uh, is, is warming three times faster than uh, the global of the that the global mean of the ocean. So this is something really, really. It's among the top uh, areas of the world, so it's a really uh, hot spot for uh, for the climate change, and this uh, translates, of course, in the warming. So the mean, uh, the, the the temperature is increasing in in the in as a mean, but there is another effect of uh, of uh, the of the warming, which is the the increase of the frequency and the intensity of uh, marine heat waves. And in this figure, what uh, we are showing is the coverage of the Mediterranean uh, that has been impacted or that suffer uh, marine heat waves uh, from the early 80s till, uh, till uh, these uh, last years. And what we see is uh, that in the last uh, five, uh, 10 years, 
most of the areas in the Mediterranean have been suffering uh, marine heat waves, the impact of marine heat waves, the so extreme uh, high temperatures, and uh, the different colors that you see in um, in the bars. It's uh, about the intensity of uh, the category of uh, the marine heat waves, and we see that in the last uh, uh, years, what uh, we are witnessing as well is the increase on the on the on the intensity of this uh, of these uh, marine heat waves. So these are. Uh, two of the main signals of the climate change, uh, the, how the climate change is impacting uh, the, 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 the Mediterranean. There are others, but these are really strong signals that uh, the climate change is hitting really, really hard in, in the Mediterranean. So we consider the Mediterranean as a, a hot spot. And of course, this has consequences or this has effects in, in, the, in different components of the, of the sea. And we have we can uh, provide information on uh, what are the main categories on, on which we can uh, provide information about these uh, changes. So the changes in the physical chemical conditions, such as uh, the temperature that I just show you, uh, shifts in the species distributions, uh, uh, even native species or, or uh, exotic species, alien species that arrive into the Mediterranean, episodic events like uh, the mass mortality that we will be showing you, and changes in phenology, so changes in, uh, for instance, in the reproduction period of uh, the different species that uh, we will be showing uh, tomorrow in, in another, in the next uh, webinar. In any case, our philosophy to for the, so we need to track these changes and uh, our philosophy uh, to, uh, to, to quantify these changes uh, has been guided for these three main principles. They have to be practical and easy. Uh, in a way that we can um, implement this in an easy way and in a cost-effective uh, way. Uh, it, the, the protocols, they have to be able to, uh, to provide information at the regional uh, strategy. So we need standardized uh, uh, protocols, easy to implement, but uh, we have to promote the, the, the implementation across the, the Mediterranean to have this global uh, view on what's going on. Phase to the climate change that it has uh, uh, global impacts. And the third principle is that we want to engage uh, local people uh, to empower uh, local communities to, to know what is going on with the climate change, because we think that this is the best way to, to tackle the, the challenge of the, of the climate change and all the adaptation and mitigation measures that we can um, adopt. So with this uh, philosophy, we have been uh, working for the last uh, 20 years in the Temenet platform or the Temenet network, which uh, for us is a successful collaborative story because uh, through this uh, uh, um, uh, network, we want to develop a collaborative observation network to track climate change in the Mediterranean coastal areas. We uh, invite you to visit uh, the Temenet uh, website. And the origin of this uh, of this uh, of the uh, net was the observation in uh, back uh, 20 years ago of uh, an unprecedented uh, mass mortality event in, in the 1999, which has a severe impact in uh, in the coasts of uh, uh, France and and Italy, and since then we have been witnessing uh, um, different uh, mass mortality events. That they have been characterized by the large scales so that the, of the impacts, more than uh, thousands of kilometers uh, impacted. Many species from different groups. Uh, we quantify more more than ninety species from different uh, from nine different films. And what we saw is that uh, most of these uh, events are concomitant or associated with high temperature context, uh, like uh, the ones that uh, associated to the marine heat waves. And at, by, by then, when we wanted to, to relate the, these mass mortality events with, um, with the temperature, we have been looking for a uh, temperature series. Uh, and in fact, in the coastal areas, we have a really few uh, uh, high resolution uh, series. And um, the, the few that we had, uh, they have been implemented by uh, the Dr. Jean George Armelin from the Station, uh, Station Marine de Dume in, in Marseille. And we wanted to, we started to promote the implementation of this, uh, of this uh, series, uh, temperature series, the acquisition 
of a high resolution temperature series because this was really important to to know what was going on on the on the on the on the coastal areas and this is uh, the protocol that uh, it's going to show be shown by by Nathaniel but uh, before this uh, when we say that the mednet is a successful collaborative story is because uh, since uh, that we started we have more than 25 uh, mpas uh, collaborating in the involved in the in the network more than 70 scientists and uh, from uh, uh, more than uh, around 11 uh, countries okay so this is uh, important uh, to see that uh, we have been building this community and uh, i'm really proud of uh, this effort that we have been conducting with uh, with nathaniel so in temenet now uh, you, you will see that we have uh, three um, uh, implemented in the platform, three uh, uh, standardized uh, protocols that the, these three are the ones that we will be uh, presenting uh, today. And, um, and uh, you will see at the end of the webinar that we intend to, to keep going with the same philosophy and with uh, the different approaches, the, the, the approaches that we use for these three to expand uh, the different uh, protocols uh, to other um, dimensions of the of the change. So I give the floor to um, um, to Nathaniel. Yes, thank you, Kim. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen now. Hope uh, everybody can see it. Okay, if I don't hear uh, no, it's uh, that it's uh, on screen. Um, so uh, I'm will start today about uh, temperature and uh, talking about uh, uh, standard and cost-effective uh, monitoring protocol to. Uh, continuously monitor seawater temperature from the near surface to the seabed in near shore and coastal areas. Um, so the important point about uh, this temperature monitoring is acquiring coastal oceanographic time series. Uh, we know that temperature is certainly one of the most important environmental parameters for marine life and it is also uh, an essential ocean and climate variable um, we know that uh, more than 90% of the excess uh, heat uh, caused by uh, human activity uh, is stored in the ocean. Uh, keeping track of the current status and changes in the, in the, the ocean content is uh, key. And uh, when talking about coastal oceanographic series, I have really always in mind this very uh, inspirating figure, uh, Joseph Pasquale, a uh, humble and visionary man who started and still uh, running a classical oceanographic survey uh, from a boat uh, monitoring the, the Catalan Sea. And uh, his observations are very uh, illustrative of what's happening and the, the pace of the, the high rates of change we are facing in the Mediterranean, uh, showing over the past 45 years, uh, uh, almost 1.5 warming for the surface temperature. And this is not limited to the surface as it's uh, 0 0.9 degrees C warming at, 90, at 80 meter depths. Um, so, Based on this, and since we are not all Jose Pasquale, a man who spent over 2,000 days at sea for this monitoring, uh, we uh, in Timernet rely on uh, progress made in uh, electronics and uh, autonomous uh, device. So as a quick overview of the protocol, in Timernet we are using autonomous temperature data loggers to continuously monitor seawater temperature at high frequency. The data loggers you see uh, here are set up at standard depths every five meter from five to 40 meter depths or more uh, by divers. Uh, they are attached directly to rocky walls and uh, deployed and recovered every six months, which ensures high return rates uh, on observations. So the main strengths of this protocol uh, is first the high resolution, high temporal resolution, 
frequency every hour, high vertical resolution across uh, seasonal thermocline and uh, uh, inside marine habitats. <clears throat> it allows uh, long-term monitoring at reasonable cost uh, with high return rates. And uh, based on this standard protocol, uh, we can uh, collect uh, information that we can compare from place to place uh, inside regions and also uh, inside the different ecoregions of the Mediterranean Sea. So today the, the protocol is implemented, or at least temperature surveys at high frequency are implemented in over 80 sites uh, from eight Mediterranean countries. So I need to, to update this part. Um, about the field work, uh, it's not about some heavy uh, infrastructure, big boats, moorings, uh, something that can be implemented uh, by scuba divers from small boats. Uh, as it is illustrated here in Portofino MPA, uh, the Ligur Ligurian uh, Italy. The, the selection of the study sites uh, will be based upon local knowledge and uh, oceanographic or ecological interest. Meaning if you have long-term biological survey, um, complementing the, the survey with uh, this temperature monitoring uh, will be worse. So some um, important aspects when selecting the site uh, it should be rocky bottom with a steep slope. Uh, facing the open sea, we want to document the local conditions, no, no particular conditions in a cove. Uh, although this can be done, uh, uh, what we present uh, in net is generally uh, sites facing the open sea. Um, can be good to, to place install loggers in a no-take zone uh, into marine protected areas as is uh, shown here uh, in uh, Scandola, uh, my protected area. And last point, uh, it's always interesting to inform uh, sea practitioners, in particular diving clubs, uh, that monitoring uh, are conducted. So, so this uh, can help in some case. The materials you will need uh, are first uh, temperature data loggers. So we are using these uh, hobo uh, loggers, so the black ones you see, with uh, initial accuracy of uh, 0.2 degree and resolution of 0.01 degree C. Uh, we've been testing hundreds and uh, are pretty confident in the, the performances of these data loggers. So these data loggers are employed with uh, protective caps uh, for deployment underwater. And what you see on the right hand figure is a fixation kit that we use to install loggers to the seabed. Uh, it's a uh, Ivegor Massila polyvalent uh, B-component uh, putty. Uh, so there is a white and the blue part that are mixed together to obtain this, uh, this uh, green putty. And uh, we also use uh, uh, some, uh, some rings, uh, inox rings or plastic screw uh, and you will also need some your, your diving knife, uh, scissors, or a cutting plier. So the, the first step will be to uh, launch uh, the, the data loggers. Um, I won't go into detail on the steps of uh, launching and reading out uh, the data loggers. Uh, there are some video tutorials uh, which can be accessed directly from the TMEDNET uh, observation, uh, TMEDNET website, observation uh, system uh, section. Uh, just recalling here some uh, main settings. So for reading out and launching the loggers, you will need a communication interface that you connect to your PC, uh, opening some uh, Oboware software. <coughs> and the important settings here are just the one hour sampling interval, uh, giving a start time at exact round hour. Uh, we want all loggers to start and sample at the same time to obtain vertical profiles every hour. And uh, set uh, a descriptive file name, uh, typically using the date, the site, and the depth. Now, we go to the field with the loggers uh, uh, programmed, labeled uh, for each depth. 
And the first step will be the, the setup of the permanent fixation as standard apps. So we are here in Medes uh, Islands, in the Catalan, uh, along the Catalan coast in uh, northern Spain. And we see this artist view of the uh, underwater seascape with the vertical zonation of uh, different uh, habitats and species. And we are going to install data loggers every five meter uh, from the near surface to 40 meter depth. The, the data logger will be set up directly onto the substrate. So I start here the, the video showing uh, the, the onboard uh, manipulation. So the first step is preparing the putty. Mixing the blue and uh, white, uh, green, uh, blue and yellow components. And uh, going at the selected depths, we are looking for um, holes, small holes, uh, distant by uh, 10 centimeter, in which we are going to firmly uh, insert the putty after having scratched up the, the substrate to, to, to make it uh, glue uh, maximum. Then into each hole, we insert the primary and secondary fixation point. So that's uh, the plastic ties, uh, the plastic uh, screws that are inserted here. Okay. Now we can uh, leave it harden for 20 hours or overnight. And um, uh, it's always useful, and I strongly recommend to draw a plan of the permanent fixations. Uh, so that's, for instance, showing the, the line you're going to follow when the water uh, from the surface to 40 meter depths. And this is useful to find the fixation points and it will be also useful for recovering the data loggers. So what are the important points? You see here on the right hand um, illustration of uh, some place at the surface which marks the start of the vertical and then the, the location and the path. Um, once uh, the fixation uh, points are uh, installed, uh, and that the putty is uh, hard, uh, we can install the data loggers. So the first point is that warning, uh, the data loggers float. So be careful about that. We are then using some uh, uh, Colson rings uh, that you are seeing on the screen to uh, attach the logger, placing two rings in each fixation. And this is the primary attach uh, securing the, the, the logger. So here it floats. And the idea is to use the second attach to uh, have it tightly uh, uh, sticked to the substrate. And it's uh, important to have this different fixation in case of rough sea, and uh, since we are going to leave the data loggers for six months or more. Okay, you also see that the data loggers are labeled with uh, the different uh, depths and uh, site info. So now this is done, the temperature survey is started, meaning that every hour and every day, the temperature vertical profiles will be recorded. And that's the type of result we obtain after six months of deployment, uh, recovering the data loggers from the field, uh, downloading the data, and uh, pushing them to TMNet, where we produce some, uh, some visualization. Um, what we see here is that we obtain very uh, um, precise information on the very fair estimate uh, of the, the conditions experienced by the um, uh, different species at the different depths. Uh, we see that temperature evolves and is quite dynamic. Uh, here showing the, the thermal stratification, which develops from uh, May, June to, to uh, November, with the progressive deepening of the, of the thermocline, seasonal thermocline, but also uh, pulse variation, dynamic events. Of course, the idea is to 
keep rolling, continue. Uh, so by doing this, uh, deploying and recovering uh, twice a year, uh, you can acquire um, time series, multi-year time series. And what is shown here is three years of uh, recording, temperature recording. It already provides interesting information, uh, allowing comparison between years, looking, for instance, at the maximum temperature, uh, highlighting the, the exceptional uh, high temperature in year 2018. It was the first time we measured some temperature above 26 degrees in the northern Catalan Sea. Um, different descriptors are calculated. Uh, for instance, the number of days above 26 degrees, uh, which is a, a quantification of some heat stress, uh, as shown here. Um, two words about the, the important step here uh, into acquiring this multi-year time series is avoid uh, interruption. So for this, and also to, to simplify the field operations, it's already always a good option to have two sets of data loggers, uh, meaning at the same time you retrieve one, you place uh, a new one. This uh, strategy uh, monitoring protocol implemented uh, through dedication uh, has allowed the, the building of unique uh, coastal oceanographic data series over the long term, as illustrated for Medes Island in the northern Catalan Sea, um, which is very vital in order to, to build baselines and uh, track changes. So everything is not that simple. Uh, it's always a matter of dedication. Uh, but again, uh, these data were obtained at reasonable human and uh, financial cost. Um, sometimes, uh, <laughs> you see, uh, we had two, two years with uh, very hard conditions, uh, fixation points that, um, that were removed and uh, loss of data. But overall, considering the entire period, uh, we can consider we have very high return rates on observation uh, using this protocol. So uh, building baseline uh, is going from marine weather, from instant every hour measurement, to this long-term view. And uh, I'm showing here uh, some very interesting graph showing the, the multi-year average temperature conditions uh, along the depth gradient. So in this figure, we combine satellite uh, information from the zero meter to in-situ uh, data acquired locally. Tracking change is when we, we calculate some uh, mean state marine climatology, we can uh, track anomalies. And for instance, in 2017, uh, we, we faced some very strong temperature uh, anomalies from 10 to 14 meter depths uh, and from winter to, to uh, fall. This uh, information, uh, this monitoring, uh, allow over the long term to calculate local warming trends, uh, as I show in these figures. And uh, we have some, some results consistent with uh, Joseph Pasquale monitoring showing here uh, in Meles Islands, some decreasing um, trend in the, the uh, warming, which is stronger in the near surface. Again, these uh, warming trends are, are very strong, uh, very rapid. So if we look at some main outcomes of uh, the Temednet initiative regarding the temperature monitoring, um, we have managed collectively with uh, the many partners involved, marine scientists and PA managers, to build this uh, temperature uh, observation network in the coastal zone. So it's a network of mini loggers uh, involving 23 uh, marine protected areas, 17 research institutions from eight Mediterranean countries. And to date, um, temperature monitorings are conducted in over 80 sites, mainly 
marine protected areas. Um, some temperature uh, series are more than 20 years long and in several cases longer than 10 years. And documenting temperature conditions from one meter to 67 meter depth uh, directly into marine habitats. So again, it's a very um, uh, important achievement, I think, that has been made through the, the collaborative uh, actions, um, which is uh, uh, important, since, for instance, for surface and model validation, uh, showing very quickly here some results uh, for satellite sea surface temperature data validation across the MED, showing that uh, still today, um, accurately measuring um, or knowing the sea surface temperature conditions is uh, a challenge and that we cannot always rely on satellite data, so showing the importance of these local measurements. Uh, of course, the, the data are not limited to the surface, but uh, documenting the entire water column. And uh, we, we obtained for the very first time some uh, detail in, in insight on the stratification dynamics uh, across spatial scales, showing, for instance, here along the, the Catalan coast in the northwest med, along the coast of Provence, Corsica, uh, Balearic uh, Islands. And uh, what we observe is uh, the strong dynamics with, uh, for instance, the influence of uh, wind-induced downwellings along the Catalan coast uh, versus the manifestation of uh, upwellings, uh, this uh, uh, interrupting the, the seasonal stratification along the coast of Provence versus more stable and warmer conditions in Corsica and Balearic Islands. So uh, temporal uh, information synoptic uh, view uh, and uh, again uh, building this regional view from local actions uh, is the main objective of uh, this network um, through international collaboration collaborative approach with uh, mutualized data management to inform on local conditions but also at broader scale and just showing uh, in this conclusive slide the, the time sequence of uh, evolution, where we were then uh, facing the first mass mortality events in the late 90s, and where we are now in terms of a uh, number of sites and uh, sample uh, uh, acquired to, to study the, the impacts. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I, I will give the floor now to Ernesto Azur. Hello, uh, thank you, Nathaniel, for this interesting uh, uh, presentation you made. Um, okay, so I will project my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the first slide, please. Yes, I go to the first slide myself. Sorry. Okay. So, um, and. I'm going to present a simplified visual census uh, methodology to track some of the effects of, of climate change. And uh, so in this case, uh, what is the, the macroscopic change we intend to document? This is uh, uh, one of the most, I would say, visible consequences of climate change, not only for coastal marine systems, but also for terrestrial habitats. This climate change is indeed driving species ranges toward the poles and uh, also increasing the risk of extinction when dispersal capability are limited, such as in our Mediterranean uh, uh, Sea. And this phenomenon is uh, uh, often indicated as uh, meridionalization, so meridional or southern species moving northwards. And uh, in the Mediterranean, this involves several warm adapted coastal fishes, such as uh, the Mediterranean part fish, the ornate, ornate rust that have been recorded northward with this respect to their original uh, geographical distribution. And this also concern uh, um, temperate or um, cold water uh, uh, species, this is the other side of the coin, the coin like uh, uh, Salpa Salpa, which is rapidly losing their 
preferred uh, climatic habitats and shrinking um, its uh, distribution. So documenting this kind of uh, uh, transformation of the, of the biotic uh, uh, component is one of the uh, key uh, tasks to support uh, current uh, adaptation policies. But the problem is that things can be particularly uh, difficult, complicated in marine ecosystem due to the difficulties of surveying such a large areas with, uh, as you know, uh, limited financial resources. So this was the background that uh, stimulated us to conceive a strategy for effective uh, monitoring in the Mediterranean region. And um, what I'm going to present today is uh, this, uh, well, strategy, this simplified um, visual census protocol, something which, that was, uh, that has been initially conceived with a network of uh, Mediterranean scientists joined, joined under the CESMA pro program Tropical Signals in uh, 2009, started the, the program. And then the protocol uh, started to be implemented and received the su support of a European funded um, project for several years, starting from the MPA ADAPT uh, uh, project and, and now the, our MPA Engage project. So data gathering began in 2009 and uh, well, the action is still active thanks to uh, living networks of uh, uh, Mediterranean collaborators. This is uh, really important for us. So who might be interested to uh, implement this protocol? So first of all, MPA managers, MPA managers willing to track the biotic effects of uh, climate change in their areas. Then environmental administration and of course, any colleagues and a researcher or practitioner who might be interested to join to this uh, research uh, network. And uh, I have to say also that the protocol can be also of great interest also for those uh, diving centers that wanted to engage uh, customers in citizen science activity. And um, I will tell you a bit more in later on in uh, the presentation about the possible implementation of this uh, protocol through the citizen science. So let's have a look at the protocol, which is based on a set of uh, candidates indicators for climate change. You see, we have um, these slides about indigenous and non-indigenous species. And uh, I have to say that recently, the number of non-indigenous species has been increased. And uh, so we have today a total of 15 species considered as uh, candidate indicators of climate change and uh, species that are targeted during the visual census survey. And uh, so why the speeches? Uh, uh, very briefly, we base it on this, this decision in collaboration with a team of ex experts selecting uh, those speeches which uh, were already showing sign of climate dependent distribution. And all those speeches are speeches that are common to find in the Mediterranean and common to and easy to to recognize and uh, the speeches that uh, according to our knowledge um, were selected to show the best responses. This, to give you an example, was um, quite clear for the pear, thalassoma, uh, pavo, coris julis. Uh, thalassoma is more thermophilic uh, and coris is more temperate. Uh, very nice uh, pear is also the pear um, rabbit fish. Uh, Siganids and uh, uh, Sarpa Salpa, both are uh, herbivore species of tropical origin, the rabbit fish and temperate uh, uh, affinity, the, the Salpa, and um, both empirical and uh, projected uh, changes uh, according to climate change scenarios are quite uh, clear in, uh, in a process of um, uh, increasing success for the Siganids and uh, decline for the, for the Salpa Salpa. And uh, okay, uh, that was just a couple of examples about the target species. And um, here in, on the right, uh, you can see uh, the underwater board we use to collect uh, data underwater. And um, each participant, uh, MPA or institution or uh, researcher was asked to select at least 
three permanent location, monitoring location, where to perform the censuses every year and along four different depth uh, layers. Um, I have to say that collaborators can, however, decide to survey uh, only one depth layer, for example, the surface by snorkeling, and this can be quite simple and um, uh, cost effective. And um, okay, this is our sampling unit. So the observer swim at a constant speed of about 10 minutes for five, 10 uh, meters uh, each minute, for five minutes sharp, covering an approximate distance of 50 meters. So during this transect, uh, all the target species observed with this transect, uh, which is uh, five meters uh, wide, are counted. And uh, the material are uh, quite simple, uh, an underwater watch to measure um, the, the, the time and temperatures, if possible, and the underwater world, board. So this action usually is a coordinated action that usually starts with a training, and uh, the training is supported by a series of uh, available training materials and tools, and then the data collection, and after which the participants are requested to uh, transfer the data to an Excel uh, file and, of course, to check their own data for possible mistakes. This, that this is just uh, the first stage of um, um, data validation, but then other um, validation, validation steps are carried out by a restricted team of researchers that are working as a coordination team. So um, I concluded the presentation of, of the protocol. Maybe uh, we can play the video um, uh, the video tutorial, and uh, after that, I can um, conclude the presentation with some example on how to use the data. So uh, maybe, maybe Jose could uh, could play the video. Is possible? Global warming is rapidly changing the abundance and distribution of many marine species. And this video tutorial will guide us in the application of a protocol of visual census, which is aimed to monitor the effects of temperature on a number of coastal fish species, which are easy to recognize and which can be considered as appropriate indicator of climate change. Transects are performed by trained divers, able to recognize and to count fish species underwater. Data are collected through an underwater board. Before the dive, we will honestly assess our ability to recognize the target species. Average, good, very good. We will also indicate the protection level of our dive site, outside the marine protected area, partial or integral. Nine target species will be counted. Dusky grouper, Mediterranean rainbow wrasse, ornate wrasse, Mediterranean parrotfish, painted coma, coma, salima, rabbit fishes, blue spotted cornet fish. We uh, might consider also that uh, marine protected areas have the possibility to include other species which can be identified on the basis of uh, uh, local needs of research and monitoring for a maximum of four. For example, we can add uh, uh, another species, the Mediterranean barracuda. Be sure to have an underwater watch with you. Censuses will be performed in correspondence of permanent locations and over rocky bottoms with a moderate slope, preferably without or with few seagrass. Firstly, we choose a depth range, for example, 11 to 20 meters. Then, we start counting the fish, taking note of the start run time. Transects are performed at a very slow speed, at 10 meters per minute for five minutes. We will record the number of target fish observed in an ideal transect 50 meters long and five meters wide. Do 
not count individuals smaller than 2 cm. When the first transect is completed, take a note of the end run time. At this point, you will perform a second census, remaining at the same depth layer. Just move a little bit forward and start counting the fish for another 5 minutes. After the diving during the debriefing, the staff of Marine Protected Areas or your diving instructor will check and validate your counts. These data will be finally copied on your logbook and uploaded to the system with a computer or a tablet. So the data that you will collect will be employed to build time series and to monitor the effects of temperature in different areas of the Mediterranean Sea. So thank you very much for collaborating and have a nice and safe underwater visual census. Okay, so that's what we uh, obtained until now. So uh, nine invo involved countries, uh, 45 uh, researchers collaborated to this uh, action for a total of uh, more than 3,000 uh, trunk sets and more than uh, 100,000 individuals counted. This is, uh, well, a large uh, data set we built, it, we developed in, in the last um, years uh, but uh, well how to use the data well it, it, how to use the data we have at different levels that in which the, this data set can be can be uh, useful the first level is the level of single mpa and uh, of course uh, the, the local level so mpa can be interested in building time series and uh, to uh, track how uh, the, the coastal diversity is is changing through time, and uh, the MPA project has developed specific tool on Power BI to help uh, the process of um, uh, data elaborations. And uh, for example, those are some uh, outputs from the Portofino MPA. And uh, at the same time, the, the the same data coming from each MPA, each uh, co collaborators can be. Uh, shared among a large community and uh, use it for a large purpose and uh, to monitor the evolution of those uh, indicators at the level of the entire region of the entire Mediterranean region so our data data policy is that uh, data needs to be open access so all the data providers uh, can have uh, the possibility to be included as um, in this co collaborative action and uh, to be included as uh, uh, co-authors in uh, of the data set we just published uh, uh, the last week the entire uh, database on on the sinoe repository we are really happy about that and uh, and we also submitted the data paper to the to the open access journal of frontiers so marine sciences so thanks to all the collaborators for um, uh, for to join to this uh, initiative uh, of course this information could be Couplet, uh, coupled with the environmental data to better understand how the abundance and distribution of those species is linked to climate change. And we can test the effectiveness of the selected taxa to track temperature variation. And uh, other potential application of, the, of this climate fish um, data set include setting a baseline against which to evaluate future changes and the resulting outputs could have uh, several benefits not only for the single MPAs, but also with possible integration at the level of um, regional initiative like uh, IMAP and uh, Marine Strategy Framework uh, Directive, since uh, those initiatives do not specifically consider climate change impact. Uh, finally, last but not least, I was anticipating you that uh, this kind of data can be also, uh, this, this protocol can be also employed by to engage uh, trained uh, divers and uh, the contribution of recreational divers in the monitoring process can much amplify our capacity to track uh, um, climate related impacts. This uh, collaboration did can be particularly effective for those diving that uh, uh, work within a marine protected area. 
And uh, at the moment, the data gathered from these uh, recreational divers are not mixed with the data coming from professional um, observers, but uh, the citizen science data are stored in the Sea Watchers uh, website, which also provide all the training tools and uh, also geographical visualization for the participating uh, citizens and, uh, and divers. This is a participatory process which has been much empowered uh, in the MPA uh, Engage project with the collaboration with PADI and DAN, which are key partners of, um, of this uh, action. So I'm um, with this last slide, I think I'm concluded. Yes, so um, thank you very much for, um, for your attention. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, now we have the last presentation by Kim about mass mortalities. Let me know, uh, um, Manuela, if you see my screen because uh, it has been. Yes. <laughs> For the moment, I don't want don't. to repeat. Uh, I don't want to repeat the, the same error. You see, my yes, screen. we see it. So go on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Manuel. So now I'm I'm going to uh, present you the last uh, monitoring protocol about uh, how to track uh, mass mortality impacts and um, uh, in the across the the Mediterranean. This uh, uh, monitoring protocol, the main goal is to assess uh, the, the impacts of the mass mortality and uh, to give an information about the conservation status of uh, benthic uh, species, especially habitat forming species that uh, shapes uh, the, the, the communities and the, the, this, the seascapes, like in this case, in this photo, uh, the white uh, Gorgonian uh, uh, Eunicella singularis. How we uh, propose you to, uh, to do this uh, uh, by quantifying the percentage of individuals affected by mortality uh, going to the field at least at the annual basis at the different uh, places. And uh, this uh, monitoring protocol can be implemented by MPA managers, uh, teams of scientists, and as uh, in the case of uh, the, uh, the fishes, um uh, the, visual, the visual census uh, by fishers uh, it can be as well implemented by uh recreational divers through a citizen science uh, initiative so uh this uh, protocol has been uh, developed uh, for uh, different target species uh, the most common ones or in which we have been implementing uh, this protocol are gorgonians uh, the red gorgonian, uh, Paramuthia clavata, the, the yellow gorgonian, Eunicella cavolini, as well the, the white gorgonian, Eunicella singularis. But uh, it can be implemented as well to different uh, sponge species, bryozoan, uh, calcareous algae, and uh, any uh, major um, uh, benthic species uh, that is more or less abundant. And in this first video that I'm going to show you, it's uh, explaining what we consider, uh, what we can consider um, um, an affected uh, uh, colony. Okay. Now I don't see the, the 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 video, so this is a problem for me. Sorry about this. So the video here, you see the 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 a healthy colony. Now we are in uh, in. Um, in a population that has been affected, uh, you see that the, the red gorgonian, the Paramothea clavata, has has a lot of uh, epibiosis on on the branches. So this is uh, typically what happened when uh, 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 mass mortality event impact. And here we have a detail, a zoom on, on a branch that has been uh, recently uh, affected by uh, mortality with this naked skeleton. And in this case, now what we are showing here is. Uh, a branch that uh, has uh, an epibiosis. And in this one, in this last image, you have uh, the example of what is a, a recent uh, affection, affected, uh, the new taxis and um, um, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, this is uh, a little bit tricky not being uh, able to see what is going on. But uh, yeah, this is the way that we can quantify the different um, uh, affected colonies so we have the healthy ones and um, and uh, 
You see my uh, presentation back now? Sorry about asking this. It's going to be complicated. Yes, yes, we can. OK, thank you. So once uh, we know uh, these uh, the, the materials that you need, you need this uh, template of um, where you, you, we will be quantifying uh, the number of uh, 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 colonies affected or not showing uh, uh, any injury, as uh, we show. And uh, to perform uh, the, um, the, the census uh, once we go into the, into the, to the field, just to avoid biases, what we propose you is to use uh, our references uh, so we can look at the second video. Um, so we can use uh, the, the quadrat uh, and then count or observe uh, the, uh, how is the status of these uh, uh, colonies inside, or we can use a bar and then take the the, the criteria of uh, only uh, observing the colonies within a, 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 a rectangle like or using this kind of a, a ruler that I, we can as well. So the, the idea is to have a, a reference in um, uh, to to be able to uh, to not bias our our um, uh, observation. So. At the end of the of the survey that we conducted, we will have this kind of uh, results. Uh, so that the, the board with uh, the number of uh, uh, healthy colonies, the number of uh, the affected colonies, and the different categories as we observe it that uh, with uh, recently affected colonies, with uh, showing uh, the naked or the nude skeleton, and uh, the 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 colonies that show. Um, um, epibiosis, so it means uh, that has been affected in the past, or showing both uh, cases of uh, those types of uh, injuries. And uh, this is the last video um, uh, that I'm showing here, just to see what is the result of conducting this kind of um, 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 uh, surveys. So you have in parallel a healthy population and uh, uh, an impacted population. And you see that um, that the number of uh, colonies use, uh, the, we can evaluate or assess uh, the conservation status in, in different levels, in good and in low status. So back to the presentation. Um, has been challenging this. Uh, uh, what, uh, as uh, Ernesto say, we developed for this uh, new project uh, a tool uh, to support uh, uh, the managers in uh, in how to un to interpret uh, the information that they have been collected in the field. How did this can be translated in uh, from the data to information to inform um, uh, the management uh, decisions. And uh, this tool, uh, it's a monitoring tool that we developed uh, within Power BI. And this is the kind of the results that you can obtain uh, for uh, an MPA. In this case, it's the Cap Creus in, in, in the Catalan coast. And in the upper uh, figure, what you have is the, the percentage of um, the affected colonies in different uh, death layers from the deep, uh, intermediate, and the shallow. And in the, in the low panel, what we have is the assessment. So we, we depending on the level of uh, the percentage of affected colonies, we provide what is the assessment. So in this case, for instance, we see that in the shallow waters, uh, the, 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 we consider uh, that it has been highly impacted, while in the deep and intermediate um, uh, waters, uh, the, the impact has uh, been moderate. And of course, uh, this is just an example, but uh, you can go uh, to the level of the different species that have been uh, monitored. So this was overall at these set of layers, but we can go to the different uh, at the different at the level of the species and at the level of uh, of the site, and we can have as well the different uh, levels of, of impact of these populations. This can help uh, the MPAs uh, to identify. For instance, if we need to put more attention in some specific species or in some specific uh, um, areas of the within the the, the marine protected area to implement some some different uh, regulations. 
So what are the main outcomes of uh, the monitoring uh, protocol on, on mass mortality? There are several ones, but uh, uh, we published a uh, few years ago um, this uh, paper, this data paper, uh, uh, gathering all the information on, um, on the mass mortalities across the Mediterranean. And of course, uh, this uh, 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 map was showing the number of uh, 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 mass mortality events in the different ecoregions of the Mediterranean and the different colors uh, 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 correspond to the different groups of the species that have been as affected. We have been enriching this, uh, with this, um, this uh, database with the new uh, census that uh, the, the network has been um, implementing uh, this, uh, during this last year. And I'm happy to announce that uh, soon we will have uh, a much larger um, uh, database available to everybody uh, uh, to, to, um, to see the, the, the level of uh, the magnitude of uh, the, the impact of uh, the mass mortality events in the Mediterranean. So overall, uh, the, the, the TEMENNET, uh, besides providing this information on how to uh, implement uh, these uh, monitoring protocols, uh, as it has been stated, we have uh, uh, we, we put a lot of importance on the data management. Uh, and uh, uh, for this, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, you need to to uh, register in the in the in the data in the in the TEMENNET uh, platform. And once uh, you uh, are registered there, you you are able to you will be able to upload uh, uh, the data uh, collected through uh, these uh, different uh, monitoring protocols that we uh, presented to you today. And you will have access, for instance, here to a, a dashboard where you can then you will be selecting uh, to which um, um, uh, protocol you want to uh, provide information, and then you will be able to upload the, the data through this. There is a video tutorials to explain how to, to do this. And another issue that uh, topic or uh, objective that we have uh, for uh, the payment net is the data visualization. We saw already some examples in, in the previous uh, presentations by Nathaniel and and Ernesto, but uh, it's um, it's uh, important to I I'm, I have here uh, just uh, two um, uh, some animations on what you can find in the in the website. For instance, here you will see that uh, you can select different places across uh, that uh, have been conducted um, temperature uh, surveys or then that have been implemented the temperature uh, monitoring protocol. And then you can uh, see, for instance, uh, in several years, what has been the conditions on the on the temperature in these two areas, in the column breads, uh, uh, protected areas, and in, uh, in Port Cross National Park. So you have the figures that Nathaniel has uh, been shown you. But we have different kind of figures that uh, uh, you can explore and see what, what's going on there. Uh, and this one, for instance, is about the threshold. So how many days uh, have been over 23, over 24, or over 25 degrees in the different areas? And you see, for instance, here that uh, it's quite different uh, conditions in column breads than in, in Port Cross, right? So this is a way to, to go uh, from the data to information and to explore. And I invite you to, to uh, to explore and to visit the, the website. Another uh, uh, tool or way to visualize the, the data is uh, through this uh, uh, module of uh, temperature visualization that allows you to explore uh, what are the conditions at the eco region or at the at level of the entire basin in different uh, topics. Like it was the previous one, it was the anomalies, and then we can see uh, temperature, the mean temperature, and you see the different figures. And here we find as well some of the figures that we have been showing uh, you in the previous. So these temperature conditions. And then <clears throat> you can compare through uh, with different uh, sites and, and explore this. And finally, we have as well 
some information about the warming rate. So you have the warming rate, so the, the mean warming rate for the, the corrosion, and then you can compare this with the information at the site level, at the MPA level. And we provide the warming rates at the, at the different, this uh, for the surface, and this is uh, the warming rates across uh, the depth in the places where we have more uh, information along uh, temper. Temporal, uh, temporal series. And finally, uh, this is uh, the, the home of the mass mortality uh, module where you have as well access to some of the big, uh, the main features of the, of the, of the implementation of the, of the protocol. Okay, so you can go there. Of course, the final pillar on which uh, TEMENNET is working on is on the training of materials. And you have, uh, during the presentations, an excellent, I think, um, uh, examples of this kind of uh, training materials. Of course, we will be sharing this webinar and the presentations, but we have these video tutorials, a step-by-step -step, uh, implementation of the, of the different protocols that are available in the, in the web platform. We organize uh, different training sessions. Uh, we started uh, this uh, photo group of uh, the first one that we organized in two, uh, back to uh, 10 years ago in, in Escandola. But since then, we have been organizing more or less every two years different kinds of uh, activities to present and um, to promote this, um, this uh, implementation of these uh, harmonized uh, and standardized monitoring protocols. So what are the next steps? So in the framework of the MP Engage, uh, we have been developing uh, new uh, monitoring protocols with the same philosophy. And uh, we already implemented uh, these three uh, protocols that we present today in, in the TEMENNET. And we are working to, uh, we want to, that these 11 monitoring protocols that we developed in MP Engage at the end, uh, they will be as well implemented uh, or available through uh, uh, and, uh, TEMENNET with all the tools, I mean, with the, with the outcomes, with the man data management, with the visualization and with the training tools. Some parts of this information will be, of course, available, but uh, what we want is to, to provide the, the, the entire uh, training uh, information and the tri for us, uh, the monitoring protocol, um, if we want to promote it, we realize that we need to, to have the information how to implement it the monitoring protocol, how to deal with the data management, how to interpret the data management and use this data management, and then provide all the tools uh, to, um, to, uh, to make it uh, easy. And uh, I'd like to, to, to finish uh, this uh, presentation uh, uh, getting back to the inspiration by Josep Pascual that we wish, uh, as Nathaniel said, that we wish that uh, we will have many uh, Josep Pascual across the Mediterranean, this is not possible, but we think that through the implementation of this, this, um, this uh, harmonized, uh, standardized protocols, cost-effective uh, protocols, we are not getting uh, uh, there, but we are getting close uh, or much closer that uh, if we don't do anything. So we have to keep going with this. So this, uh, we need, um, despite all the efforts, we need to increase our, uh, um, number of sites where we have been uh, implementing this. So we invite all of you to, to join the, the network and uh, support the network uh, for uh, understanding and providing information and uh, 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 promoting uh, the, all the actions that we need to, uh, to adapt and mitigate the, the climate change effects. And in fact, uh, if we take uh, uh, the map of the, the marine protected areas across the Mediterranean, we could say that we have more than 1,000 opportunities to contribute and adapt to mitigate the climate change and the biodiversity loss crisis. So, and I'm finalizing here with the lemma of the of the project, MPA project, which is act local and think Mediterranean, and the collaboration and cooperation across the Mediterranean is more needed uh, than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you to all the speakers for these very interesting presentations. Uh, we now have time to take one question for each of the speakers. Uh, let's start with uh, So the question was, 
proposed by Jessica Ballerini, who is asking to Nathaniel, how can you tell the difference between done welling and up welling? Okay. Uh, hi, Tosca. Uh, I think that's something you can really uh, experience physically, <laughs> just uh, bathing during summer. Uh, so, talking about uh, wind-induced uh, upwellings and downwellings, uh, we know that the, the Mediterranean uh, Sea is extremely responsive to strong wind events. Uh, what happens is that when the wind is blowing parallel to the coast, it can bring uh, um, water to accumulate to the coast. And then the deepening of the, the surface uh, warm water to depths. This is what we call downwelling. And this is good for deep diving. Uh, the, the thermocline will go down. Upwelling is uh, the when wind uh, blows the opposite uh, direction, still uh, parallel to the coast. Uh, it will bring coastal divergence, uh, which is uh, under Ekman transport, so the main influence of wind and the surface circulation. And then you have the uplift of deep and cold waters uh, up to the surface. So, for instance, in Marseille, where I live, uh, there are about 30% of the summertime during which the water reach temperature uh, down to 16 degrees C. And this is not because the waters are cooling, it's because the water are spreading to the, to the open ocean and the uplift of, uh, uh, of this deep and cold water, which are also nutrient rich. Uh, so, this is uh, something uh, which illustrates the very strong variability of the coastal zone. And uh, we are currently working on uh, characterizing the different areas across the Mediterranean Sea uh, where there are upwellings and downwelling uh, occurring and uh, quantifying their, their occurrence. Hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Now, Apeli Tosca uh, was posting also another question to Ernesto. Uh, so, can the FISH Visual Census protocol be used by university students to carry out a thesis? Yes, this is uh, actually one of the many possibilities of the protocol uh, because of its uh, simplicity can be easily transferred uh, uh, also to to student and actually we had um, already uh, three uh, master theses which focused which um, adopted this uh, this protocol in different uh, areas of uh, the Mediterranean and in collaboration with uh, uh, diving clubs uh, working within marine protected areas so well thanks for this question because it is an another uh, uh, potential application of, uh, of this uh, approach. And uh, it's cost effective so that it's easy to obtain uh, results and uh, it's also a nice, nice opportunity for, uh, for students to be engaged in this uh, monitoring process. Thank you, Tosca. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, finally, we have a question for Joachim from uh, Mimosa Kubani. Uh, I hope I understand well the question. So uh, Mimosa is asking if the affected coral colonies, um, the, the damage we can uh, detect uh, or uh, totally or partly can be caused by abusive practices. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what is important is uh, it's true that uh, once uh, the colonies are affected, uh, the, the coral ones or the gorgonians, uh, they, for a while, they can uh, show the, depending on the, on the nature of the skeleton that they have, they can stay for uh, more, or some more or less time on attached to the to the substratum. This is why it's important to. Um, to conduct these annual surveys, because in this way we can track if in this uh, in this uh, site, for instance, uh, the, what is the condition of the of the population. So we can see 
uh, how this evolves in, in time and uh, in, and then we can identify if this uh, the, there is a recurrent uh, impact of, uh, of mass mortalities and if it has been uh, recurrently affected uh, probably what we can uh, witness is, is uh, 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 the process of uh, local extinctions so I forgot to mention in uh, in my presentation that um, it's good to have these permanent sites uh, within the MPAs where you can go every year and uh, monitor uh, the condition. And then in this way, we build, and this is something that we have been stressing in all the presentations today, that we need to build this uh, time series. Uh, so in this way, we can uh, effectively compare what's going on and track what are the trajectories in, in, the, in the populations. In this case, we will see, for instance, if, if a, a population of corals have been uh, impacted by different um, uh, mass mortality events through time, we will, will be able to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to see this and to quantify these impacts. And then maybe we can, we can uh, see that uh, once, in some cases, once where we have uh, a population now the, the abundance of this uh, species is, is really low. I don't know if uh, this was the, the I answered the question, but uh, if it's not the case, uh, please uh, uh, say it and I'll try to do it later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, uh, actually, we don't have uh, additional uh, uh, question on the chat, uh, but you can always write us directly to um, to, if you have additional questions on that uh, and so on. Uh, so now we can have maybe some concluding remarks from our speaker, if they want. Uh, for instance, also regarding the feedbacks that you get from the MPAs who apply this protocol in uh, the MPA Engage project. I don't know if some of, some of you wants to comment on this. Yeah. I, I can comment that uh, this, these protocols, um, they have been uh, implemented in, in the MP Engage project for sure and um, in, in previous projects. And uh, this, uh, most of the MPAs, uh, they are really happy with this, uh, all the materials and the information that these uh, protocols are uh, providing. Of course, there are the new protocols, uh, some of them, they need some adjustments, but uh, what we are presenting um uh, you today is a uh, really robust uh, protocols that has been proven uh, the their effectiveness in terms of uh, in the field implementation but as well in terms of uh, the, the information that is uh, that they provide and this information it uh, regards of course uh, the scientists uh, the, the the scientific information but uh, i want to stress that it's not only science i mean what we are uh, here looking is uh, to support management and uh, to support management uh, regulations or management actions from science-based evidences. And uh, this is what these uh, protocols are, are providing. Besides, it has this other value uh, of uh, that uh, most of the protocols uh, we, we try to simplify and uh, we provide as well the framework on how to implement them uh, with the support of citizen science, which it has the added value of expanding our um, observation capacity, but uh, as well to involve or to engage uh, these uh, uh, more people, more uh, the public, the society in the in the in the in the process of the monitoring, and in the same time involving them in the in the in the finding or building. Uh, uh, or defining what are the actions uh, that we can take to face the, the climate change. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So if there are no other um, additions, uh, we can close here the webinar. I would like to thank the panelists and the participants for joining the webinar. I hope it, that it was of your interest. And as I said before, feel free to reach out uh, to any one of us for any further question uh, you should have related to the webinar or to the MPA Engage project. 
Uh, finally, uh, we hope to meet you again tomorrow for our last module, which uh, will focus on how to monitor the conservation status of Posidonia oceanica habitats, Pina nobilis, and sea urchin population. And uh, it will be held uh, as today, as usual, from 10 to 12. So goodbye and thank you for participating. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.